Welcome to the Thornton Business Hour, the Washington Metro Business Resource Program. Stay tuned to hear about business programs, incentives, and much, much more with your host, Pat Thornton. Welcome once again. I always begin by thanking you for tuning in to the Thornton Business Hour. I know you have many choices, yet you've chosen to be with us, so i certainly like to thank you for doing so. Today we have a special guest in the studio, just as always, and I'll go right into letting you know who he is. His name is S.L. Young. He allowed me to call him Sly. He's an author and a blogger on the Huffington Post. He's a project and program leader, business professor, inspirational speaker, And he's just an awesome gentleman who's dedicated himself to helping others. He says that he writes and speaks about dealing with life and business topics. His books and blogs provide solution-oriented guidance to address challenges such as belief, educational struggles, depression, suicide ethics, workplace bullying, and more. He's also the founder of a nonprofit organization. His give back is the Saving Our Communities at risk through educational services, Socrates, which teaches individuals at risk communities about life, business, and soft skills. I'll let him have an opportunity to tell you more about himself because all of this little bit and that that I'm reading doesn't really tell you the inner self of the gentleman I'm speaking of. His name is Sly Young. Welcome, Sly. Well, thank you for having me. It's It's certainly a pleasure to have you now. You had such a varied background, you know. I want to give you an opportunity to tell people what is your your core core business and and what is your passion? What what brings you to the point that you're at today? And I always like to let my guests do that themselves. Well, my background is primarily in telecom and doing project and program management. I've done that for about fifteen to twenty years. Um, after working at one corporation. Um, once the, there was a merger, I made a decision to move on, and I tried some consulting for a while. So I did consulting for a few years, working on some very large programs um, in IT and operations and network security and a lot of different areas. And then once uh, all of those opportunities were tied up and done, I decided to move on to do something different. So went to work for an organization. Um, that was doing some training and development, but it wasn't a good fit for me, and the executive was very abusive. So um, after that point, it actually led to a period of depression, and then I, after that moment, as I was trying to figure things out and how do I want to move forward, I, lo- I started looking towards a new direction, and I first went towards writing. So that's my primary thing that I do right now is I write a lot, and then after that, um, I, I wanted to give back to the community because I'm a former at-risk student, so that's what led to my nonprofit, Socrates. And then after that, I said, you know what? I have all these other things I've been developing, I've been working on, I have all this experience in publishing, consulting, training. Why not create my own business? So I launched my own business this year, Beyond SPRH LLC. So tell us about Beyond. Well, Beyond SPRH LLC is a or is a business that helps individuals and organizations to drive their maximum performance, whatever that is. So on a consulting side, I can help them from doing management consulting, organizational behavior, looking at the organizational dynamics, project program management, training and development, helping individuals to learn more about business and the skills necessary to be effective in organizations. From a training perspective, I do things that work from an individual perspective and also from an organizational perspective. This past weekend, I did a speaking engagement at a organization which is a fraternity where I I was helping them to lead through transferring individual knowledge to organizational knowledge to maximize success. So there's a lot of different elements. So there's the publishing piece also, which I'm looking now to help other individuals to publish their works as well. So that individual knowledge transference, you know, what we often call succession planning, Mm -hmm. um, that's a critical point that many businesses miss. Um, If you don't transfer the institutional knowledge of an organization, an entity, a business, even a profession, you know, a hobby, if you don't transfer the institutional knowledge, then there's no way to create that legacy to carry on. 
So um, understanding the importance of that, how might you go about doing that? Why, why is that so critically important? You can reemphasize that and uh, how you might go about um, retaining and preserving that, that knowledge. Well, a lot of times in organizations, we're focused on delivering uh, the things that we need to complete within the organization for the organization to meet its performance objectives. But we don't spend enough time working on developing the individuals within, within the organization. And one of the things that's really big to me is working with the individuals to develop their skill set. Because if I develop the skill sets of those individuals, then they're going to be more loyal to the organization a lot of times. And then they're also going to help us to better meet the performance objectives within the organization. So our jobs as managers and leaders ultimately are to develop the individuals within the organization as they work to deliver their task to deliver performance for the organization so that the organization can meet its operational goals. So developing individuals so that they can grow and learn within the organization and also move up is, I think, one of the, cre- one of the key skills for, for leadership. You know, we always talk about organizational development, but we very rarely talk about emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. And it appears that that part of what you're speaking about is the fact that managers need to be emotionally intelligent and they need to understand the inside of the people that they deal with. They need to develop their 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 character, their values. There are business there's a business value system. And if that is not uh, consistent, then you have an opportunity for there to be a lot of difficulty and difference in an entity. And and a lot of managers don't realize that it's more critical to develop the individuals than it is to develop the skills. You can almost teach almost anyone who has the basic skills how to do something, but you can't teach them how to behave. So how has behavior played a role in the success of an organization and how has it contributed to its downfall? I, I believe that you were talking about reacting to some experiences you've had in terms of developing your current business, uh, core business. So tell us about how behavior impacts businesses and what your organization does about that. Well, you know, first I'll I'll speak about it in in two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So from an organizational perspective in the organizations that I've managed big projects in, and then also from within the classroom, because I brought that same mentality to the classroom as a business professor. So from an organizational standpoint, it's very important to develop the relationships and to pay attention to those little nuances that are going on in the organization, because as a project program leader on on multi-million dollar projects, I can't be everywhere and can't do everything for everyone. So I have to rely on the resources that are within the organization. So part of that is developing those relationships from the very beginning, coming in and saying, hey, I'm new to your organization. I want to learn about what's going on here. I don't have all the answers. Let me have a conversation about what's going on in your organization so that I can learn more. And then collectively, we can work together. But the other thing that I like to do in the early stages of the relationship is to identify what are their pain points? What are the things that keep you up at night? Because if as I forge that relationship, if I can resolve those pain points and then as, as I work to resolve those issues and I keep them involved and they become, tr- um, you know, a part of the t- solution and, and then that level of trust starts to develop, then we can get a lot more done. Because in most of the projects and programs I've ever worked on, the folks that have saved me are the ones that I developed that emotional relationship with because they didn't have to come and tell me the information that they did. They did it because we had that relationship and they trusted me over time because they knew that I was looking out for their best interests. Now, on the other side, in the classroom, I try to bring that same mentality. So one of the things that I always like to tell my students on the first day of class is that each of us has walked in here as an individual, but we're going to develop our organization starting tonight and over the course of the semester we're going to have a lowing sorry a learning and growing organization and that begins with calling on my students by name so on the first night i learn my students name because when you can call on someone by name versus saying hey you uh, it creates a different dynamic because just by calling someone by their name looking them in their eye and making that personal connection then you're allowed to connect that learning process not to just being in a classroom with a bunch of individuals, but now you're creating an organization, a collaborative organization that's willing to learn and grow together. And one of the things that sort of covers over both sides, whether it's in a a corporate organization or within the classroom, 
when you can create an environment where folks are not afraid to take a chance or ask a question, it changes the entire dynamics of the relationship. So that actually is a nice segue to an issue or, or a topic I wanted to discuss of workplace culture. Um, you're speaking about developing a culture, a sense of a safe environment. And oftentimes in our workplace, a safe environment is not high on the priority. What's high on the product priority list is productivity and outcome. And uh, we tend to have foremen and individuals who manage us who are just concerned with that bottom line. And we miss in between. And when we do, uh, we actually miss meeting our bottom line oftentimes because we don't pay attention to workplace culture. You've written a lot about workplace culture and ethics and how that plays a role in the workplace. Tell us how you feel about ethics the role of ethics in a workplace and workplace culture? Well, I think ethics is an important characteristic, not just in the workplace, but just in life. Um, personally, I don't want to work with individuals who aren't ethical. And there's unfortunately a culture now where individuals believe that they can um, or they need to do whatever it takes to win at any cost. And I fun fundamentally disagree with that because I don't have to do whatever it takes to win at any cost because if I take care of myself and my character and do the right things and work hard, all the things that I need will develop over time as, as part of developing those relationships. So ethics is something that's very important to me. So I, I stress that on the projects and programs that I work on, not only by the things that I say, but by the way that I lead. And by leading by example, then I hopefully influence those around me to do the same thing. The same thing happens in the classroom. Yeah, I have students, you know, every semester, unfortunately, I catch one or two students who plagiarize material. And I tell them at the beginning of the semester, there's no reason to plagiarize anything because there's no value in doing that. Because what I'm looking to do is to develop your experiential knowledge, same thing that we're looking to do in organizations. So stressing an environment where ethics is important and that anything less than that will not be tolerated is very is something very important that from a leadership standpoint, we need to make sure that our leaders all the way down are um, making sure that they're communicating that in the organization. Now, one quick uh, question about plagiarism. It's my understanding that um, there are programs that can actually detect if one has plagiarized and taken something from the Internet. And, and those of you who are schooling out there, you need to know about this. Tell us about, you know, the fact that there are many, many tools that university professors can use now to automatically let them know that you've lifted something. Oh, now you're going to make me put out my secrets, how, I, how I'm checking on things, I'm but sorry. that's okay. <laughs> so um, I actually use a, a software package um, that allows me to take material that a student has submitted because sometimes you see things that are inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And actually, while I was grading last night, I had one of these incidents. And I copy the text and put it in a software package. And within a matter of moments, it sends me back a report. And it tells me um, where the information has come from. So I can actually go back and look at the links, and it, and it highlights uh, the information, and then I can actually send the students a report also. Can we share the name of the program? Uh, it's called Safe Assign. Safe Assign? Yes. A S S S A F E A S S I N I G N. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Safe Assign. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, you can have an opportunity to speak with Mr. Young, and you can call in at 1 800 450 7876. That's 1-800-450-7876. What's your website? It's www.slyoung.com. That's www.slyoung.com. Now, when I come back, I look forward to hearing from you at 1-800-450-7876. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. So you got to be a fly on my wall as we're talking about what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a little bit of everything, but we're going to begin by carrying on that discussion about ethics. Uh, we mentioned that ethics is, of course, a value. Your parents teach you about being ethical. 
But when I go to work and I'm the person who doesn't want to take home the pen or the ruler, people look at me like I'm crazy. I've never had a job where I wasn't asked to slow down. Could you please slow down so you can stop making us look so bad? And and, and the the last one is something that, that, that actually concerns me. I've never, I've probably only worked at one or two places, which I can't even recall right now. I'm just saying that to be appropriate. But um, I cannot recall a time when I've worked at a place where there wasn't a certain amount of unethical behavior going on that I was encouraged to participate in. And my problem would always be at the point in time which I decided not to participate in either the unethical behavior and either the cover-up and doing something that I had uh, committed not to do, um, there would be a disconnect, if you will, And that would either be with management who was telling me to do something. I remember one of my first jobs here in D.C., I was told to change someone's evaluation. I wanted to give someone an encouraging evaluation. And they told me, and I wanted to be honest, though, and talk about the things where they needed improvement. My manager said, in in our place, we, we encourage individuals. So we want to give you a little higher evaluation at this point. And you can make it in the comments what you want to say. That still felt honest. I could do that. And then the boss had a problem with this individual. And after I met with the individual, they wanted me to change the evaluation without meeting with her again. I said, one, it's what I wanted to do in the first place, but actually yours is more drastic now. I can't can't put someone like on a pip or make those types of comments without meeting with them again. And uh, quite frankly, if you want to do it, it's outside of my purview. It's within yours. Why don't you do it? And uh, they, of course, had much difference with that. You will change this or else. And um, I didn't change it. But for a little while, I had a rough spell. And I was smart because I sent something to um, employee, you know, service, whatever you want to call it, or employee relations where they protect your interests. And I said, I want you to put this in my file. Presently, I have above standard in all of my uh, ratings here, wherever it is that I'm working. And um, I had a little bit of a difference with the management, and there may be some retaliation. So I want this in record, that one may be retaliating because I chose not to do something illegal. And so when it came up and I went to the next evaluation, they tried to put unsatisfactory all down the end of my evaluation. I just called employee relations, and, you know, they had to kind of revert that. But people don't always have the foresight, and it's often thought that when you're responding to negative evaluations and things is because you're being retaliatory. So tell us a little bit about ethics and the opportunity cost of being an ethical person in a workplace. Yeah, so a lot of times when we're dealing with ethics, we don't really deal with the emotional aspects of being ethical. And someone who decides to combat, confront, or deal with ethical issues in the workplace, they can experience some emotional feelings that Um, You know, should I get involved? Should I not get involved? Um, Then there's the psychological or the physiological aspects of that where you might be, um, have experienced some anxiety, some depression, um, sweat, um, you know, other ways that they can be manifested, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing is from a moral standpoint, because when we're putting to a situation when we're asked to do something that's against our beliefs, our values, then it can cause um, questions about, you know, should I go along with this or shouldn't I go along with this? And, you know, that really factors into an individual's beliefs because I always like to say that a lot of times as it relates to beliefs, there's three components. There's a concept, um, there's a consideration, and then there's a convenience. So we could say from a conceptual standpoint that, Ethics is bad, and we should always resolve ethical issues right away. So that's the concept. Then a consideration where a lot of times where the ethical litmus test is, we have to make that decision whether we're going to get involved or are we going to be complicit and just allow that behavior to go unchallenged. And being complicit is also allowing it to happen and saying it's okay in, in some form. And then there's convenience. And a lot of times when we make decisions, it's based on convenience. So I might not want to get involved as I consider it, but 
from a convenience standpoint, if you, Pat, are in the way of my next promotion, and now you're the one thing that's going to block me from getting it, now it becomes a little bit more convenient for me to do something that I might not have done as part of the consideration, stressing back to the concept that I said I would always resolve ethical issues. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of interesting. You know, now, when we think about resolving ethical issues and we talk about the differences in, in what one is experiencing, we always have differences in what we ultimately do. Now, what might be some of the um, behavior that you might recommend an individual um, employ if they find themselves in that situation? That would be very helpful. You know, it's just like we, you talked about stressors, identifying stressors for individuals. When you're setting up, you're facilitating a project or something like that, you find out those pinpoints, those stress points. Uh, the same is true with ethical behavior. Uh, when I go into an environment, I, I kind of decide what I will and will not do so that when it's, when it's brought to me, I, I may not do it. I may not get involved with ratting on everybody else, but I, I give myself standards that, I, that I, I will abide by so that when someone approaches me, I know what to say that may allay their concerns. And there are things that we need to do that help people to survive in the workplace. So what are, what are some of the, some of the uh, tools that you've come up with? Because I know that's something that you provide in some of your, your sessions. Yeah, so the first thing starts with knowing yourself. Because you've got to know yourself and what you are and what you aren't willing to do. Because if you don't understand that before you get into these situations, then it becomes even more troubling to figure out wh what the right thing is to do. Or a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just go along because we don't know what our beliefs are. And instead of going through the stressors, the mental processing to figure out whether we should get involved or not, we just say, you know what, I'll just look the other way and, and I won't get involved. But that's from an individual standpoint. You've got to know what it is that you believe in. From an organizational standpoint, and this is where it's really important, the organization has to have an ethical culture, which is not only communicated once a year, but it actually has to be on display. So individuals within the organization have to display that ethical behavior time and time again so that other folks know that this isn't something that's going to be allowed. And then most importantly, when those ethical issues occur within the organization, there has to be quick, act, swift action, and there has to be enforcement so that others in the organization know that if these things happen, the organization is going to deal with it quickly, and also they have to be consistent in the application. So you can't say, well, for this person here, we're going to do this, and this person here, we're going to do this. Because when you have disparate treatment within the organization, it leads to a lot of other issues because then they say, well, Sometimes I might get caught and I might get my hand slapped heavily, or sometimes I won't get caught. But if we have an environment where it says we're watching, this, well, this is our belief, this is what we expect you to do, we will be monitoring, and we will punish those who don't behave in an ethical manner, then it establishes that organizational culture so that everybody else can follow. That's very critical and um, something that doesn't exist in many organizations. Most people... Um, either are not aware of the culture. I know when I worked at AARP many, many years ago, used to, that's the time when, when people were stealing software a lot. And so, you know, when you went into the copy room, um, there would be a big poster that said, you know, do this, that is steal software, and get that, get that, get, get some handcuffs, <laughs> you know. So if you do this, you're going to get that as a response. And there were always reminders in places where you might be considering to do something wrong. There were always reminders about what their culture is. Yeah, and you know, one quick story that I'll share, and it was really the defining moment for me in terms of how I thought about, you know, the way that I thought about ethics and the way that I responded to ethical actions. So I was actually, um, there was a buddy of mine I worked with many, many years ago. We used to go to lunch all the time. I always had a great time out at lunch. And then one time we were at lunch, and we had both worked at a previous organization where we got a discount on our long-distance service. So it was like $25 discount, and they hadn't canceled my $25 discount. So I was still getting it a few months after it. So we were discussing our previous, you know, this discount at lunch, and he said, oh, yeah, I, I was still getting mine. And then I called and then told them that I was still getting it. And it was that moment of silence, awkwardness, 
and the realization that I had a choice whether I allowed myself to continue to receive that credit or not, or did I take action? And so sometimes we grow ethically by being around others who are ethical because prior to that, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. They would get to it whenever they got to it. So if I got, I received that credit for another nine months, no big deal, right? But uh, once he gave me that look and that feeling of being uncomfortable, I said, you know what? I have a responsibility and you know, I have to be responsible and accountable for my own actions. And I'm getting something that I wasn't supposed to get. So then I called and got my credit removed as well. And, you know, our friendship was never the same after that. And I regret that because that's one of the biggest regrets of my life because I, I think I, I know I lost a good friendship because I didn't do the right thing. And then it taught me that from that moment forward, I needed to do the right thing. You didn't lose a good friend because you didn't do the right thing. A good friend would have would have um, shared their information with you and been thrilled that you had an awakening and a difference, you know, based on what they said. And, and sometimes we, 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 we oftentimes have to look at ourselves based on who we are. And we are only as good at, as, as where we're at in the point of life. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You know, so, so if, you know, you just told me a story that helped me to realize that I might have that kind of opportunity in the future. I don't have it right now, but I might have that opportunity. And your sharing that story helped me to look at that differently such that when I move away from, you know, a current employment situation, I might make that call that I wouldn't make before. Yeah, and, you know, one other quick example, you know, with this, uh, the Patriots, with the deflate gate, I was talking to my nephew oh, yes. about it, right? And so we were having a conversation. He's like, well, what's the big deal? It didn't impact the outcome of the game. And I'm like, no, you know, if it actually happened, you know, cheating is cheating. It doesn't matter what the outcome is. So we have to make sure that we stop thinking if it doesn't affect the outcome, then it's no big deal. Cheating is cheating. Mm -hmm. and, and we are where we at, you know, we are who we are, and we, we forgive ourselves as we move along. Because um, I used to tell my students, I used to teach it as well in college, and I used to tell my students, you're responsible for that which you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try and make sure you know all that you need to be responsible for, but I may miss a hit a little bit. And if I do, you're responsible for that which you know. You may know within something that I have not told you, but you're responsible for that which you know. So if I told you, you're responsible for it. And um, if you miss, I'm going to come and treat you all the same. But you have to take, be accountable. You have to have accountability into structured into your systems. And so we're going to take a brief pause again. Uh, but when we come back, we're going to let you have that comment that you're holding on to. But I didn't want him to open it up, and then I'd have to shut it down. So if you hold on to that comment, we'll tell you to call in at 1-800-450-7876. I'm getting the signal. It's one 800 Four five zero seven eight seven six. Don't touch that dial. We'll really be right back. Fourteen fifty W O L A M, where information is power. And we're back. I invite you once again to call in at one eight hundred four five zero seven eight seven six. That's 1-800-450-7876. And before we took a brief pause, I, I asked Mr. Young to hold on to a comment, but I'm going to actually insert one of his comments because it's actually apropos right now. When I was reading his bio, I didn't get a chance to read this. And um, he mentions on his website that as a little motto, life won't wait for you to get ready. You're the one who needs to catch up. You see, we have to take responsibility for wherever we're at in life. And we often like to place blame on others, on circumstances, and on our moment. And very rarely are we taking personal responsibility for needing to catch up to wherever it is we need to get to. So with that, I'll turn it over to you because you had something else to say about what we were discussing. Yeah, so as we were talking about ethics in the last segment, you know, Maya Angelou has, uh, you know, her piece, and hopefully I don't get it uh, totally wrong, but, you know, she'd like to say, those who know better do better. 
And it's our responsibility, once we know better, to do better. And that's what happened to me as we were telling that, uh, you know, as I was telling that story in the last mm -hmm. segment. Yeah, those who know better do better. It's just like I was talking about the responsibility for the students. That which you know you are responsible for. Now, you talked a little bit about having had an experience at the workplace that, you know, actually encouraged you to move on from a particular uh, site and also allowed you to actually expand your abilities in terms of addressing that for others. And one of the things I find that you uh, appear to do in, in many of your life works is to reach out to help others regarding with regard to places that you've been, experiences that you've had. So tell us a little bit about that and what brings you to do some work in workplace bullying and the like. Uh, so there's a lot in, in those questions there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to sort of back up a little bit yeah. before we go forward. Sure. Um, so th the first thing that I, I'd like to start this with is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And too many times in life, individuals suffer needlessly, similar to the way that I did, because we're afraid to tell others that we're going through something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Two years ago when I started writing, I started writing some inspirational quotes. And then as I started working through some of the things that I was going through, including some depression, I started examining the things that in my life that were harmful. And as I started to examine those closer, I realized that there was a lot of lessons. And I started having conversations with others about it too. And I said, these lessons need to be shared because if all these things are happening to me, imagine how many other folks it's happening to that aren't telling their story. And too many times we get so caught up in the shame, the fear, the embarrassment. This happened to me. What if I tell somebody? What if they find out? And that's the mentality that we have to get away from because that holds us back. Because what I found um, after my darkest moment of my life last year was that once I released what I thought was the worst secret possible that I was suffering from depression and that I had almost committed suicide – once I got past that moment and released it, it led to my awakening. And now I'm, a, I'm more productive than I've ever been, but I also am not carrying that guilt or that worry about what somebody else is thinking about me. So once you can get to a point where you don't worry about that and you're not going to allow anyone to treat you less than what you value yourself, then that's a great place. So, so that's sort of you know a segue into workplace bullying because – when I had this incident with a senior executive, and this senior executive was abusive all the time, everything I did was wrong, would isolate me, would pull me into a conference room, close the door, and would yell at me and, you know, call, say demeaning things to me, said that I didn't have certain knowledge that I, that I did. And I don't care how strong you are, when you're in an environment, when you have a senior executive, and there's, you know, there's, there's not as much that you can do. You know, a lot of folks say you can go to HR and they'll get involved. But when you're dealing well, with a senior executive, a senior vice senior president, executive. It, exactly, you know, it, it's a lot more challenging. So um, in workplace bullying, you know, what I like to say is folks will use um, harassment, intimidation, and threats to get what they want. But then they'll use their power, influence, and control to achieve their objectives. And so workplace bullying is not about the individual who's being bullied. It's about the bully and their need for, for power. But the other side of that is we also need to speak up and not be afraid to say that these things are, are happening to me. So what I did was I looked back over my career and I thought about all the different incidents that had happened. And, you know, unfortunately I remember things and I, you know, I hold on to it. I don't allow it to hold me back. I'll, I'll, I use it to make me better and learn from experiences. So I look back over my career. So bullying can be something that's very subtle it could be just a comment, or it could be something really aggressive in terms of physical contact, because unfortunately, that happens as well in the mm -hmm. workplace. So now, in terms of addressing it, I know that you've written a lot about workplace bullying, and you've written about um, what people need to do. And, and in terms of our workplace culture, what, what is it that you recommend? Well, the first thing is, once you identify a situation that you're uncomfortable with, is to make a note of it for yourself, but also to have that written documentation just in case something escalates. Because a lot of times, um, part of the issue is having documentation of the things that happen. So to be able to keep your you keep a log in terms of what's going on, when did it happen, what time did it happen, what were the circumstances surrounding it, and be as detailed as possible. 
Because what I've found is when we don't have that record, as you get further and further along, sometimes the, the history and the information becomes gray, so we can't remember all the particulars of what has happened. So first is to, you know, ad identify that there's an issue that you're uncomfortable with, but also you need to have a conversation with the individual who you feel is creating a hostile work environment or a threatening work environment to say, this is how I feel, and I don't care for this behavior, and how can we work through it? And sometimes you can work with someone and say, hey, this is what's going on, and then they'll say, well, you know what? I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I was doing that, and they'll make the adjustment. But then you get those individuals who don't care, and then what you need to do then is to one, you know, first have the conversation, and then sometimes you need to go to HR, to human resources, to have a conversation to say, this is what's going on in this environment that's making me uncomfortable, and I can't deal with this alone, and that's what they're there for. But then you can also, you know, and this can be a little tenuous, you can also go up to the next level manager and say what's going on as well. But it starts with identifying what the issue is and being specific about it, having conversations to say, this is what is bothering me, and then following up to make sure that the issue gets resolved because sometimes we deal with it once and then we're like, okay, I tried to deal with it. It's not going to get any better. I'll just deal with it. But that's not the approach. Well, you know, in, in the situation, I'll use the same situation so I don't have to tell a lengthy story, but that I was dealing with when they wanted me to change the evaluation. After I refused to change the evaluation, I was really bullied. I was actually harassed. I should have pressed charges. Um, the senior manager actually called for a meeting with me. He acted like it was going to be at the end of the day, like 4.30, but he came at 5 o'clock when everyone was gone. And he brought me in this legal library, and he told me, this is what you will do. And I told him that uh, I believe that we've reached an impasse because my attorney has told me that if I do this, if the person presses charges, they're going to come from me because my signature is on that. So we reach an impasse, and you need to go along, you see. But the other person, the HR person, told me to start writing down everything. So when someone tells you to do something, you say, uh, wait a minute, let me, let me write, can I write that down? You have to write things down. You have to start documenting because you have to document that you went through all levels and things. But what you'll find is, one, if you do, if people do what you originally recommended they do, Address the individual. Most people are not addressed, especially managers. You're fearful, you're threatened, and you don't say anything. So if you merely say something, even if they act like they don't care, nine times out of ten, trust me, their behavior will change. And they'll be more on guard because they know that you have identified this. And when you go through legal procedures, they'll want to know if you have identified it to the individual in case they say they didn't realize that. Yeah, Senator. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of points that I'll make. You, you know, sometimes in organizations you have those organizational stars, and they're allowed to get away with a lot because they deliver. And that is the wrong mentality because we cannot allow organizational stars to use the workplace as their playground just because they have a lot of information and knowledge because they should not be allowed to terrorize others. And unfortunately, that happens because if you're if the best performer, folks tend to look the other way, and, th and that can't be allowed. But the other thing that we need to discuss as it relates to workplace bullying is also, you know, a lot of times folks say workplace bullying, someone called you a name, they said something you didn't like, they yelled at you. But workplace bullying is a lot more than that because workplace bullying can lead individuals to do things that they wouldn't otherwise want to do. We've been talking a lot about ethics earlier. Workplace bullying can lead folks to do things that – are unethical that they wouldn't otherwise do because there's different ways that folks can influence someone to do something. So we also need to look at that aspect of workplace bullying because workplace bullying where it's allowed to continue in organizations can impact uh, ethics within the organization. It can impact the delivery of su successful projects because I know that I've worked on projects where I've had individuals within the organization, you know, when you're working on multi-million dollar projects, you have a lot of folks with a lot of competing interests. And what folks will do when they have the power or believe that they do, they'll try to influence how you put together a schedule. How do you put together the budget? And sometimes I've been forced to put together schedules that I knew that were wrong, but I had to put it down on paper because the executive told me that's what needed to be put on paper. And then we ended up not delivering on time if we had followed the plan that I had that had a few more months or a different budget outlook, 
then we wouldn't have been in the issue that we that we were at that particular time. The critical path would have been better, and you'd have some cushion in there so that you could have different directions to go. And 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 that's going to lead us to a different discussion about um, workplace culture that we're going to have to come back to because we have to take another pause. But we're going to tell people how to get in touch with you. So tell us about how they can get in touch. Oh, before we do that. Uh, you know, seeing you know this is this this senility, if you will. Um, I wanted to tell people uh, where they can go to find out more about workplace bullying. I know when I was looking on your website, you had some um, some some articles, so you could tell them about your website and tell them where to go. Yeah. So again, my website is slyoung.com, and then on my website there's a blog section. So I have a lot of articles about life, and, uh, a lot of articles about life, and a lot of articles about business so and it's from a solution oriented approach um so there's also a section well and then you can connect to my nonprofit from my base website as well as my new for-profit business oh that's great so you know that's slyoung.com www.slyoung.com and if you want to speak with mr young you'll have one more opportunity dial in at 1-800-450-7876 That's 1-800-450-7876. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. You know, sometimes the engineer looks at me and he says, like, um, it is time for you to begin speaking. And I'm so busy enjoying the music that I just forget. So I was just grooving there. I certainly like to thank Gordon Productions that creates that soundboard for me. But uh, we're back. You have one more opportunity to speak with Mr. Young at 1-800-450-7876. And uh, during this last segment, we would like to talk about, you know, something that might encourage you on your next path. You know, when you listen in, I always have action items. There's always something that you can do to improve your station in life, whatever that might be. And one of the things that has come to light as we've been discussing workplace culture, ethics, and many other topics during this past hour is that you have a choice. You know, you have a choice in ethics. You have a choice in dealing with workplace bullying. We have a choice. That is your power. The power above that, as my daddy would say, God rest his soul, is that, um, you know, you are a person of your word and you also have a choice to keep your word. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about owning your path and and making choices in your career. But before we do that, one of you have hearkened to our our opportunity and invitation to call and we have Denise on the line. Denise, welcome to the Thornton Business Hour. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, I appreciate you taking my call. I'll be very brief. Uh, I just have one comment to make, and that is I think workplace bullying has had such a surge in this country is because we, unfortunately, are not a cooperative country. We are a competitive, combative, pugilistic uh, nation. And because of that, our young people learn very early how to be combative and publicistic, even when they are supposedly playing with one another. And because of that, we have moved from just being cooperative and understanding to being bullying in everything and what we do. And until we stop looking at who can be best, how can I step on you to get to the top, then we will never be free of this. Thank you for taking my call. Have a good day. Thank you so much for your comment, Denise. Um, you know, we, we talked about about choices and we talked about career paths, and I, I just think that it's it's critical. One of the things that you mentioned, Mr. Young, is that you had experiences and you took from your experiences to create new opportunities for yourself. So as we do so, tell us about your recommendation that, that you may have for individuals in terms of incorporating their life experiences into the opportunities that they create for themselves? Well, it all starts with having a a personal vision. And one of the quotes that I have in my inspirational series is, loosely paraphrased, is change who you are by first determining who or what you want to be. 
And, and that's where it starts. You have to understand what your vision is for yourself. And so no matter the things that have happened to me over the course of my career, my educational journey, or my life experiences, I've continued to redefine my vision. Because you can't just have one vision. You have to continually define what that vision is and make adjustments along the way. And then from there, you have to make sure that you develop some goals. And I, I like to have very high-level goals that I'm inspiring towards, um, something beyond my wildest beliefs. Uh, because when you work hard for something, you shouldn't just work for something that's right in front of you. Work for something greater than you could have ever imagined, and then you might achieve so much more than you ever could have um, thought of before. But then you also want to have objectives, and you want to have short-term objectives. As, as you know, These apply to the goals as well. You want to have short-term, six months, to a year, um, you want to have some midterm goals, maybe two to five years, and then some long-term goals that you want to achieve as well. Absolutely, and we're going to talk about how you can make those decisions, but we have someone else who's harking to the call. We have George. George, welcome to the Thornton Business Hour. George, you still there? Uh, hello, George. Welcome to the Thornton Business Hour. Your question Thank you for or comment? taking my call. Sure. Um, I'm asking you a question about uh, ethics in the church. Uh, I see the churches are dropping the ball when it comes to things with parents of the years. Can you comment on that? Sure we can. Now, you said dropping the ball. Can you be clearer? Well, I, I'm in a situation where a certain choir a person comes to church and, and changes their attire in church for performance on stage, and I think that's highly um, inappropriate in God's house. Um, and leave shoes around and stuff. You know, I'm wondering about that. About four years ago, that happened. Well, you know, I, I don't want to address that specific issue, but what I, what I will tell you is that um, in organizations, there are always ethical challenges that uh, might need to address, need to be addressed. So what you have to do is look at what the individual is doing and how that may or may not apply to the organizational's culture and have a conversation with the individual about what they're doing and try to redirect their activities towards the organizational's goals, the organization's goals and objectives. Well, that's exactly what I did. Uh, went to the person myself, and I appreciate that because I did the right thing. Oh, absolutely. Now, everything's much better, but we do have to face up to uh, things instead of just letting them pass on by, you know. We appreciate you sharing that for sure because and it's it's difficult to make the decision to actually address it. So we certainly appreciate you doing that. Oh, yes. God's always in charge of my life, and he told me that's the best thing to do, pray for my enemies. Thank you so much, and thank you for your call, sir. Yes, thank you for your program. Man. I appreciate God it. So God bless okay. you. And um, George brings up a very important point, and, and that is – the challenge to make the decision to actually identify a behavior that's outside of the culture of ethics inside a place like a church. It's a choice that we have to make, and the approach, the direct approach is always the best approach, not only in the church but in the workplace as well. I want to ask you a question I forgot about before. It came to mind when George was speaking when we talk about workplace bullying, oftentimes it's designed to make you leave because we baby boomers, we're working a lot longer right now and they want us out. So they want to write you up and they want to get you in the office and they want to threaten you because they don't want to pay that um, unemployment and they don't want you to, they want you to retire. They want you to go away quietly. So tell us about what's going on with that because that's a big issue right now. Those of you who are having a lot of problems on your job who have never had problems on your job all of your time. I have family members who have been places for 40 years, and all of a sudden it's a problem. They want her to retire. She could have retired from the time she was there 30. Well, I can't address that specific know, issue, but, but um, what I will say is a lot of times what happens, and I'm glad that we're circling back to this, a lot of times what happens in an organization is the workplace bully bullies the targets and they end up staying in the organization and then folks who are being bullied end up leaving the organization whether they go to another department or they go to another company 
because folks don't want to speak up or they just don't want to address it because they know that, especially if you have a supervisor over you or someone who's in control of something that you might want or something that you might get in the future, they're afraid to speak up. So the organizations have a responsibility to make sure that they create a culture that folks are protected whenever they speak up to say, I'm not being treated the way that I, I should be treating. I treat it. And then the other thing um, I would encourage folks to go out and look at on, on my website, I wrote a article sometime last year that was entitled, Is Workplace Bullying the New Discrimination? Because um, some of the things that individuals are doing within organizations can be considered discriminatory, but they're not discriminatory if they're not part of a protected class. So, um, you know, one of the things I referenced in a previous article, there was a gentleman um, in the, uh, the north who worked at a dealership. And when he worked at the dealership, he decided to wear an opposing team's tie that wasn't the one that was being supported in the dealership. So he came to work with his tie on, and the manager, general manager there said, take off the tie. And he said no. The manager said, take off the tie. And he said no. And this went on, and he refused to take off the tie because he believed that he had the right to wear that tie to work. And he ended up being terminated because he refused to remove the tie. So when there isn't a protection under a protected class, folks can use other things to get you outside of the organization, which might tie back to the question that you really originally asked me. Absolutely. And um, make sure that you know your rights and that you take notes and that you communicate. But on the career path and owning your own career path, how might one transition from their thoughts, their passions to, oh, you know, I can't believe that this time is going up, so I'm about transitioning and everything. Tell us your, your last point on career path and give you an opportunity to kind of wrap up and tell our listening audience what you feel they most need to know. So in that minute, because you only have a minute left, I'll let you do that instead of the career path number. And I thank you so much for being here. Well, I'll just say really quickly, own your career path. Nobody else can do it for you. You've got to you've got to own that. So just a little bit about what's going on with me. Um, so I have a lot of books out on my website. I, again, I, I write about business and life from a sol solution-oriented perspective. There's also free videos out on my website as well. Really looking to partner more in the local community. I'm currently working at, at a local jail, volunteering, teaching inmates about business, life, and soft skills. I look to continue to do that and expand the services as well because there are a lot of folks that are in need. And I also encourage folks to go out and take a look at my new company's website, Beyond SPRH LLC, because there's a lot of things that I'm looking to do. And there's samples of my work out there as well so that you can take a, take a look at the things that I have to offer. Okay, Beyond, S-P-R-H, L-L-C. And I say Beyond because you're going to remember Beyond. Just do Beyond and S-L Young and you'll come up with it. I'd like to thank you once again, Mr. Young, for being here. Thank our engineer, Alonzo. And I thank you out there for listening. I'm wishing you a blessed week. I'm Pat Thornton signing off for the Thornton Business Hour. You just be blessed. Fourteen fifty W O L A M where information is power.